All right. Um, when's our final again? Wednesday. What time? Twelve o'clock Wednesday. Um, where's the erasers? Yeah, that's about it. That's it. Bless you. Bless you. All right, now, some people have put their projects in the Dropbox outside my office. If you have them with you, uh, just, if you have your projects with you for that, uh, just hand them, I'll tell you what, pass them over this way, and then pass them to the front, okay? And just when you get them, just put them up here, okay? Just put them all up here. Did you turn in yours already? Did you turn in your project outside my office? How many put it outside my office? All right. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, make sure you turn these in because what I'm going to do is sequentially go through them. And if I don't have yours, you're not going to get a grade. So I can't be more clear about that. All righty. Now, uh, today, what I had planned, actually, I had a few things planned. What I wanted to do is first get all these so if anybody comes in late remind them to hand in the this and then send me an email with it within the title uh, or in the subject area put 3320 or a bit project something like that because I have too many emails to cull through and please don't send it through Gmail Gmail's getting blocked now I think uh, or Yahoo so make sure you send it through your dot Auburn or at Auburn dot edu they've got all sorts of problems with phishing things that so they, I think they've been blocking a large amount of uh, Gmail and things like that. Do you guys get that too? Do they block yours or not? Yeah, I, I know that I think it's Yahoo, Gmail. I'm not sure if they're doing any other ones, but any of these, I think Tor Mail too. There's a Tor Mail thing they're blocking because a lot of this is basically just spam and phishing viruses. So before I get on with it, uh, any questions at all about homework, past or present, from this course? You can find one, right? Uh, I have one from Homework 11, but it's not from my iPad today. What is it? Just tell me what it's about. And I do want to thank you for video recording this. That that's a that's a real benefit to a lot of people. It it saves me the time for going over what was covered. Just look. And I mean, you got a permanent record of everything. All the mistakes, all the foolhardiness. What is this? Just read it to me. I don't have my glasses. Oh, okay. so, it was B equals J. Hold, hold on. I, I'm hoping somebody gets rid of this board. Uh, I mean, at least replaces it with a true whiteboard. Go ahead. B equals J. B equals J. Okay. Uh huh. You not. I not. J? Yes, sir. I'm giving you the uh, formula for an e-field. J as in imaginary. Oh. J times I? I Sorry. Okay. Times L times, times e to the negative G beta R. Over 4 pi R? Over 4 pi R. Uh -huh. Times J beta plus 1 over R. Uh, times wait, 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 wait. Up here? On uh, the top. Yes, sir. Is, say it again. J beta. Another J beta? Yes, sir. J beta. Okay. Plus, this is a full formula, yeah? Right? Uh, plus, I'm sorry, times sine theta. This whole thing is times sine theta, right? Yes, sir. And the A prime direction. Yeah. All right. Now, that's the entire B field from a short dipole. Let me just tell you what this is. If you went through and did this rigorously, if you have a dipole of length L, and it has a current I, and it's short, so L is much, much smaller than the wavelength, then this would be a short dipole. Now, what they're going to ask for, I think, on this one, is the actual E field, I think. Is that right? All right, if they want the E field, it's kind of an interesting problem because I'm, I think Riggs would be more inclined to give this kind of a problem. But if you have B and you want, and you want to do it correctly, completely, where you can't make a mistake without assumptions. If this is given as the B field, then if you divide it by mu naught, all right, that is the H field. It has to be. Do you all agree with me if it's in free space class? 
because B, and one of the things I, I tell people, you have to know these things. You have to know that D is epsilon E. You have to know that B is mu H, where epsilon and mu have a relative permittivity of permeability, and then the epsilon 0 and mu 0. All right? And then J is sigma E. All right? These are things you have to know. Divergence of D is rho V. And the integral of h dot dl around a closed loop is equal to really i, I'll say enclosed. That's, that's Gauss's, I mean, that's Ampere's law. So those are things you kind of have to know. And by this time, if you've been doing the homework and all this stuff, that's ingrained in you. It's like knowing that v equals ir if you've had circuits. You, it, you can't get through circuits without knowing that. Now, for this particular problem, here he gives you B, you get H. Now, there's one way of getting E no matter what. First, this is also somewhere in there, it's stated that it's in a, a free space. That means sigma is zero, all right? It's in free space. The next thing you do, this is for a short dipole, if you want the E field, you can say that the curl of H normally is equal to sigma E or J plus epsilon times DE dt. Now, that's the time-varying form of Ampere's law. Does anybody recognize that as Ampere's law class? All right, normally, it would be J plus the partial of D with respect to E. I'm putting in the substitutions for, for uh, J and for uh, D, okay? Now, that's still in the time domain. When you go to the frequency domain or the phasor domain, this becomes a J omega, so you have curl of H equal to sigma E plus, and this would be j omega epsilon times e. Now, you have to know this kind of stuff. Because this is an assumption, or it's presented as that's the, the environment it's in, you get rid of this. So that means e is found by taking the curl of h and dividing it by j omega epsilon. If you have h and you do the curl operator properly, you have to get the e field. And something I'm going to say also, I don't... This is usually a uh, gradual elective. But this, along with the curl of, uh, really curl of E, is equal to minus dB dt. These two laws, that's Faraday's law of induction. That's Ampere's current law. And they're both in the differential form. Those things are mutually consistent. And they are the reason, they're the mathematical description of all the electromagnetic events that we have in our universe, as we know it, in the macroscopic sense. Now, on the microscope, or I should say on the quantum level, there's another thing that comes in. It's called quantum electrodynamics, or QED. Richard Feynman was the guy that came up with this. Has anybody heard about this, Feynman diagrams? All right, now, when you get down to the microscopic, or I should say the quantum level, quantum levels of energy, these laws still apply, but then the solutions are not going to be continuous. You're going to have discrete states of energy, but these still solve the actual problem. You follow me on this class? So there's forbidden energies when you get very small. Some of you will be in device physics or developing. You'll be in areas like quantum, uh, elect or quantum computing and things like this. You have to understand that, that there's a lot of things at the very, when things shrink down to almost nothing, the laws are still truth, but the solutions are discrete in terms of the values the energy can have uh, for photons and everything like that. All right, now, if you want me to do this, this is in spherical coordinates, right? I'm not going to, I'm going to give you the, um, if I ask you to do anything with a curl operator in cylindrical or spherical, I will give you what that is. I do not expect you to know that. In Cartesian, you should know, but this is spherical. You can tell because that's A theta, right? And it's a small, actually in his book, he has this as a, or I, I may have put it as a small R there, right? So this is going to be in spherical coordinates. Now, if you, do you want me to do this whole thing? It, it's straightforward operation because now you need the curl of H. And the curl of H, you'll notice this has only an A phi component, right? So on the back of your book, uh, last, the actual back cover on mine, I think that's the same with yours. You look, and there's... The curl is on the bottom of the second to last part of the book. And when you go in spherical, he has, since we have only a 
theta term there, right? Or phi, I'm par pardon me, that's phi. I didn't put that down there. This should be a phi, isn't it a phi in yours? Let's take a look. It's a phi, not theta, my mistake. When you look in there for the curl, um, you're going to see you have 1 over r. Then it's going to be ddr. We don't have a dr, so I mean an ar, so we forget about that. Then it's going to be minus, and it's going to be the quantity d. Uh, d r of r times, and this would be h phi, and that's going to be in the a theta direction. There will be no a phi term. Something I'm going to tell you about the curl operator. Whenever you take a curl of a vector, it that never has a component in the direction of that vector. If this vector has is in the a phi direction, when you get done with a the curl, there is no a phi component. All right, they're always perpendicular. Curl of f, it will be perpendicular to f. All right, got me on that. So now the the other possible the other possible term is going to be in the ar direction. It's going to be plus one over r times the sine of theta, and uh, then you have d d theta of sine theta times a phi, or h phi in this case, and it's minus, oh, we don't have an a theta, so it's, that's, that second part is gone, and this is in the ar direction. Now, now it's a matter of turning the crank and putting in the values, so this right here is my h phi. And now I can put this in and say that therefore curl of h is equal to one, minus 1 over r times d dr of r times that right there. And that's i naught l over 4 pi r. And then it's times e to the minus j beta r times the quantity 1, or j beta, pardon me, j beta plus 1 over r and times sine of theta right there. Plus 1 over r sine of theta. And then it's going to be d d theta of sine theta times uh, that whole bunch of stuff, which is going to be. And there was a j I missed in that one, too. There should be a j right there times j i naught l over 4 pi r times uh, j beta. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. No, there isn't a j there. I take it back. The j's right there. There should, there should be a j there. And then it's going to be plus 1 over r times e to the minus j beta r times the sine of theta. And that's in the AR direction. And this is a complete, this will give you the complete, this will be equal to j omega e, epsilon e. So when we take, when we do this, we'll divide it by j omega epsilon and we'll have our value. Now it's really turning the crank mathematically. It's just being a good bookkeeper and doing the right mathematical operations. First, I'm going to take a look at this one and examine it. I can see I have an R and R, so I'm going to get rid of that. Over here, uh, when I look at this one right here, do you all see that uh, the derivatives with respect to theta, 
the sine theta term is the only thing that exists as a function of theta. You all see that? So the only thing I'm going to do is take this sine theta here and make it squared. All right? Now, for this one right here, when I'm looking at it, I can see that really, because the derivative is with respect to r, I can say that the curl of h here would be equal to minus, and this is going to be 1 over r. I'm going to leave that out in front. Now, when I take a derivative of this with respect to r, I can think of, well, I can take the sine theta out in front. Sine theta I can put out in front, and then I can take the i naught and l over 4 pi also. Just leave that alone. So I've taken this and put it here, and I've taken the sine theta. So I now have this times this and this. So the derivative of this with respect to r would be minus j beta e to the minus j beta r, and then it's going to be times this, j beta right there plus 1 over r. Then it's plus that, which is e to the minus j beta r, times the derivative of this with respect to r. And that would make that minus 1 over r squared. Y'all follow me? I've, I've done this, so this is my first function, f of r, and this would be my g of r. And I've just done the standard chain rule. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Do you follow me, everyone? I'm trying to do this quickly. This is kind of one of these things that's a little more bookkeeping than I, I feel comfortable with right now. But if I do this, I can see uh, that's this one over here. When I take a derivative of this, uh, I can tell you what I'm going to get. Now, this is in the a theta direction. For this one, I have 1 over r sine of theta, and then it's going to be i naught l 4 pi, and then r, and then it's j beta plus 1 over r. That comes out. And then e to the minus j beta r. But then the derivative of sine squared is 2 sine theta times cosine theta. That's the derivative of that with respect to theta. 2 sine theta, cosine theta. Everybody agree with that? Now, you can see that one of the things that happens is the sine theta cancels right there. And let's see if we get any other cancellations. Uh, no, not that I can see. But now, what you're going to have to do For this one, I'm going to go ha I'm ahead and have to pull out and basically just make this thing into, I can pull out the e to the minus j beta r. I can pull out the sine theta i naught l over 4 pi. There's a 1 over r stays out. And then I'm left with uh, basically minus j beta times j beta plus 1 over r minus 1 over r squared there plus that. And that's... Once you just sift through it and neaten it up, that's the way it's going to happen. I'm not trying to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to crank, to turn the crank on something this elaborate, or I'm just going to tell you that. But you should at least understand how to do this, because this will, if you apply the rules, you can do this for anything. So a good question for the final that you, I expect somebody to ask me in some form is, will we be expected to actually do a curl or a divergence or a Laplacian or a gradient? And the answer is yes. So you have to, you're responsible for knowing how to execute those things. Remember, they're simple derivatives. The only thing you have to do is look at what the statement for either the curl, gradient, divergence, or Laplacian are, and then execute it correctly. There's not a lot of tricks involved. Right? That problem was, that was one just to get you through it one time to do something like this. By the way, the answer was given, right? Not in that one? Isn't that... Well, send me an email. I'll put them. If they're not up, that's, that's very odd. I usually provide all the solutions. All right, um, another question. That was a long one, but yeah. You said you'd be providing the Carolyn gradient. For Cartesian, I mean, not for Cartesian, but for, um, for cylindrical and spherical. I, can, I might even put it on for Cartesian, but the Cartesian <laughs> is simple. I mean, that's just, you know, the matrix AX, if you want the curl. It's on the first... Um, 
Rho, it's AX, AY, AZ. Next row, D, DX, D, DY, D, DZ. Next, AX, AY, AZ. And it's just doing the determinant. It's fairly straightforward. I can provide that, though. All right, other questions? All right. No? No. Okay, I got some. By the way, when you do these kind of problems, here's a tip I've learned. If you have access to a whiteboard, because these things get really long and you can erase it easily, it's much easier to do it that way, just for the record. Uh, when you get into grad school or in business, or if you get these large projects, a big, not this kind of a board, but a true whiteboard is very useful. Last time I was talking about uh, magnetostatics, right? We're going to do we're going to do electrodynamics too, or the induced EMF. But really, the thing I want to think I, I'm going to focus on making sure you understand is long wire kind of problems. So here's a typical kind of problem that I cover when I teach EMAG one. If you have a current here, I call it I one, and another current here. I2, we're going to do two things, and these are separated by distance D. All right? Now, if I want to know, if these are infinitely long, if I want to know the force on this wire per meter, force per meter on this wire, does everybody follow me on this? Two infinite wires, they're in a vacuum for all intents and purposes. So I want the force per unit meter, and I want you to remember what I'm telling you here. Wires where currents in the same direction pull together. Wires where currents are opposite push apart. All right? And the way I can prove this to you, if I need to, is if I look at just this wire, you all realize the current's going up, and the beat, if you take your right hand, stick your thumb in the direction of the wire, your fingers, as you or open a door, you might say with your right hand, they point in the direction of the H field and the B field. How many realize that? Okay, this is basic magnetostatics that you have to know. That means the B field from this one right here, right here, would be pointing into the board. The value of the B field right there from the first one would be equal to mu naught I over 2 pi, the distance of separation, which is D. Most of the time you've seen that written rho, right? It's a direct measure perpendicular distance from an infinite wire. Then it's going to be going into the board, and I can put my coordinates any way I want. I'm going to choose uh, going up Z, coming out X, and in this direction Y, okay? So if it's going into the board, it's in the minus AX direction. Do you all agree with that, class? Give me a show of hands if you do. You're, you look a little tired, just like I feel. Hey, look, I know. I was in your, your shoes one time. I know how it is when at the end of the semester, you've got five projects due, you're already behind in a lab thing, and then you wreck your car, and the world's coming to an end. I've been there, done that. I had mo I've had all sorts of problems. I've been sick as a dog, too, in finals, and I hate that, because then you've got to struggle through it, and what was already tough becomes almost impossible. All right, that's the B field, right? Now. What is the force, differential force on a wire? This is important. The differential force is equal to I dl. That's a vector crossed into the B field. That's the differential force. If you integrate that over a meter, you got the force per meter. Do you agree with me, everyone? If you've had me, you remember this problem, I think. How many have had me for Emeg1? All right, then you probably remember me harping about this. Now, this is interesting. We have I as I2, don't we? The B field is caused by I1. So I can say that, therefore, the differential force would be equal to I dl. Pay attention to this. This is going to be I2. What direction is I2 in? It, and that's something you have to say. And so it's going to be, it's going to be AZ dz. AZ is the direction. dz is the length. It's a differential length. It's got both vector direction and it has an incremental length. 
it's crossed into the B field. Well, the B field here is mu I1 over 2 pi D, and it's in the minus AX direction, right? I want to do this one time so you can see. I'm, doing, I'm putting down all the details. I don't normally do this. Now, when I look at this, I can say the differential force here is I, it's really going to be mu, call it mu naught, mu naught I1, I2 is proportional to the product of the currents. Then it's going to be over 2 pi d. It's inversely proportional to the distance of separation. Keep this in mind. All right. Next, I can see I have a dz here. So it's going to be proportional to length. is proportional to differential force. And then when I have az crossed ax, what do I get? Z, az crossed ax is? Uh-uh. AZ cross AX is positive Y, right? Positive AY. Remember, X, Y, Z, X, right? That's all positive. So X, Z crossed in X is positive AY, but there's a negative sign. So that makes it, if you added that on already, then you're ahead of me. So this is minus AY direction. Now that's the differential force. You'll notice the differential force is pulling this way. The differential force on that first wire is pulling that way. They're pulling together. This is real important. Now, if I want it per meter, I just integrate this from 0 to 1. And what do you notice it is? You notice the force, therefore, per meter pulling together would be equal to mu 0 I1 I2 over 2 pi D, right? And then it's going to times 1 meter. If I integrate 1 meter, I just get 1 there. And it's in the minus AY direction. That's force on the second current. That's per meter, correct? I'm going to tell you something here uh, in a second. If the currents are in opposite directions, they push apart the wires. Now, some people are going to think, well, why do extension cords not blow up? Because the force is so extremely small. And also, it's 60 cycles. Usually, we don't have DC current. 60 cycles, there's a, there's a moment, there's inertia to the wires to get the mass going before it can ever get going. It's already the phase changes with your sinusoidal currents and stuff like this. So at best, it vibrates at a very, very small level. You can get them to vibrate, though. You can actually see if you put about 30, 40 amps of current into, a, into an extension cord, and you had any kind of, it, don't go around and do this. And if you have one of these micro sensoring things that they have, uh, they use this in a military and things like this. They can actually like shoot a window with this and they can hear people talking behind it. I can't think of the name of this device, but you can actually see the vibrations. It's microscopic. And the reason is this. You see this? Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th, right? That's a force in newtons per meter. This is an extremely small force, below millinewtons for most stuff per meter, which is almost nothing. All right. Now, based on that, I got one other thing. Now, some, you guys, if you've had me, you know I, I tell this story. I had a professor who worked out at Los Alamos, and he was not there doing the original weapons test, but he got out there, and he was doing, uh, he was my major professor. His name was Les Hales, passed away. He was a, a, he was a very well-known guy. He was, a, an, a, he was a, one of these chair professors. He had the Knoll professorship, all sorts of great things. And he was really an atmospheric physics guy. But one thing they discovered out there, when they're going through uh, the sands, when they have to do excavation and stuff, they found that railroad tracks who had been laid in it. This is the story I got. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm going to say this is a fairy tale because you're taping me. And somehow I think there's classified information I'm probably getting in trouble for. But anyway, just assume this is a fairy But what happened was they went there, and the actual rails were pulled together off very old mining place. Like they have these, these they would go from... They'd have mines that would be out there, but they also had tracks that extended from the east coast to the west. So these are buried in sand. There's all sorts of stuff that happens out there. But they dug them up, and at least portions of these are pulled together. Now here's what happens. When a nuclear weapon goes off, an air burst, you leave a very hot, positive fireball of charge with a lot of charge. I don't know how many, you know, kilo or maybe mega coulombs are there. But all the electrons get blown off. It's called Compton electrons. And they go into the ionosphere, and they want to get back to their parent charge. Well, they go through the path of least resistance. And one path of least resistance is through those railroad tracks. 
And the currents it takes to do that are millions of amps. But that's literally what happened. They had that much current for a sustained period that pulled them together. So the railroad, the, what he described it is they basically saw this where they were fused together, which is kind of amazing. Another story. How, how many know what the Bikini Islands tests were? Anybody? What were they? It was the largest airburst hydrogen bomb experiment ever done by the United States. I think it's the largest ever, but I'm not actually sure about this. And it was 2,000 miles from Hawaii. Well, this is before transistors, before the EMP could ruin everything. But 2,000 miles away, the grid in, power grid in Hawaii failed. Now, that caused a lot of eyebrows to raise. 2,000 miles from an explosion? That's insane. And here's what happened. That charge gets knocked off. Well, one thing Hawaii had is a lot of salt water around it, which is conducting, and also had a long power grid system that wasn't used to the typical large-scale disruptions that happen as you get towards the North Pole where you get the aurora borealis and all. And so their grid got taken offline, which nobody expected. As a matter of fact, there were a lot of other weird things that happened, but that's not the fast transients. That's due to the charge trying to get back together. And that's scary stuff for people <laughs> that work around power company things. Anyway, and that's the reason I'm telling you to remember this, is remember how the railroad tracks got pulled together, current in the same direction. Yes? Why'd you integrate from zero to one? Because I wanted per meter. All right, that'd be force per meter. Out of curiosity, if you want to, if you want to think about this, uh, what is it? Railroad tracks about a meter apart? I'm not. Maybe less than a meter, right? About three foot. Well, that's about a meter, right? Put that as a meter. All right. Now you need a force of about, I think it's, uh, it's a hundred thousand pounds per foot to actually shear these, these, what do we call those things? Those spikes that they put in there. You know what I'm talking about? Railroad spike. You can actually figure out the amount of current it takes. It's, it's literally about 100,000 amps or more. But I'm not going to go through and do it now because that's uh, 100,000 is 10 to the fifth, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the fifth, that's 10 to the minus seventh. It breaks it down, and if you do the math on that, it's over 100,000 amps. We've done this before. Huh? I'll tell you, you can fool around with this, but you know what's scary about this? That current doesn't just flow on those railroad tracks. That current was flowing everywhere on the surface. And so you have to ask yourself, what life form survived? <laughs> I, don't, I, I have no idea the impact on the life. But whenever they do nuclear tests, there's a whole group of people that study the impact on life in the area. And you notice they did it in the desert. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a whole lot of problems out there. But if they did that in the sea, I don't know what happened. I'm just curious about that. Anyway, you can, uh, you can read about some of these old nuclear tests and see what you can find. There's a lot of disinformation out there, I think, done on purpose by the government. Because the more lies you throw out there, the less likely people believe anything, right? So you throw a lot of lies out there. People believe what they want and realize they're confused. They do this all the time. <laughs> all right. That's one thing I wanted to cover. Another thing I wanted to do is this, and I want to make sure you know this. Now, this is a classic example of a mutual inductance problem. So first, what if I wanted the amount of flux that penetrates through this, this section? Take it one meter, one meter long. And now I want the magnetic flux. Do you remember how? Did we ever do this in here? I think we did when we did EMF, didn't we? In the beginning, did we do this or no? Well, you should have had it. So if we want the magnetic flux, through there. It's really the integral of B dot DS over that surface. This is the flux linking these two. It's the flux from this one penetrating. By the way, they're both in the same direction, right? All right. So if I want the flux linkage between there, right, or the total flux that's going through there, how would you get it? Now I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have to say that's I1, but this is going to be I1 coming back if I want mutual inductance, all right? Because now it has to be in the differential mode. Do you follow me on this class? If it's, it's acting like an extension cord, current going down that way, coming this way. The B field from this one is going into the board. Do you agree with me? Just do the right hand rule. If I put my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingers point into the board, correct? When I come over here, this is the return current coming down, I can see that it's also in, right? 
If I asked you for the flux when both currents are the same and going up, it would be zero through here. They would cancel. All right? But now we're talking about mutual inductance. So the flux, I mean the B field from this one points in, the B field from, from this one points into the board. Now, to get the total flux, this is the way I tell people I do it. I know that the integral of B dot DS from this wire only, from here to here, has got to be the same as the integral of B dot, D, uh, B dot DS from this wire from here to here because of symmetry. Does that make sense to everybody? It will be the same value. So what I do is this. And for this particular problem, you actually have to have a wire with a certain radius or it won't work. I'm going to have a wire with radius A here and here. And now I'm going to say that magnetic field flux will be equal to this. It's going to be a double integral because I'm going to go both rate, I'm going to go in the, call it the rho direction, and I'm going to go in the z direction. And it's going to be the B field, so it's mu zero i over 2 pi, and I can use rho here, and I'm, I'm kind of casual about this. Rho would be this distance. I'm going to take this over rho, and now it's times, and it's going to be in the A uh, phi direction. I multiply it by A phi times D rho D Z because that's the differential surface right there. D rho D Z is the actual differential area. It's A phi is the direction. Does that make sense to everybody, class? Now that's only for if I go from uh, from rho goes from A to and call it D minus A. And here's what I mean by that. If the center to center separation is D, center to center, then if I start here, I start at A. It would be D plus A is where I start, and I end up at D minus A. Do you agree with me on that? So I start here at A, and I end up at D minus A. It's not going to matter if it's a separation is significant compared to A. And for DZ, I just go from 0 to 1. When I do that, I find out that the, and I do one other thing. I put a 2 here because I know that's only the flux from one wire. But the actual flux will be twice the in flux from one wire. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? I'm telling you, always look for shortcuts. Symmetry should be exploited. Yeah. Uh, well, rho is the radial distance, right? So I'm, I, I could use x, but I chose to use rho because it, it lends itself to cylindrical coordinates here. And when I, when I do this, rho integrates out anyway. Now I get mu zero, I get 2 actually over 2 pi. And then I get mu zero, and I get i. And I get the integral of 1 over rho is natural log of rho from d minus a to a. And I also have to multiply the height, which is just 1. So this is the magnetic flux penetrating that. You can see that that cancels. You agree? You all remember doing this kind of problem? Yep. All right, now if that's the flux, what if I want the inductance? This would be the mutual inductance. What's that always? Inductance is always what? Flux linkage divided by current causing it. Correct, class? You always take a, you remove the current. Inductance is never a function of current for any linear device. And what does that mean? Well, that's going to be mu zero over pi times 1 times the natural log of d minus a over a. And by the way, that is the mutual, I mean, sorry, that's the, yeah, mutual inductance per meter. This is per meter. For any two wires with radius a separated by distance d that are parallel to each other. That's common. I want to tell you one other thing. I haven't done this in a while. But if that's the mutual inductance, suppose I also want the effective capacitance between these. I want to know what that is. I'm going to show you a trick. This is a professor's trick. I know something. I know for this is an electrostatic problem. And the electric and magnetic field are perpendicular to one, of, uh, one another everywhere. It's called a TEM mode. It's true for transmission lines. It is not true for waveguides. Now, when you have this, there is a relationship that happens. It, assuming there is no discontinuity in mu or epsilon, so the, in other words, you have to have the same value of mu and epsilon everywhere for this to work. For a lot of problems, it's the case. But you can do this. You can say that 
mu times epsilon, in this case it's mu naught times epsilon naught, will be equal to L times C per meter. So if I have L, I can get the C per unit meter, the capacitance per unit meter, without ever doing another difficult calculation or integration. I simply take the value of mu epsilon and divide it by L. So if I want the capacitance per meter, I have one, I have mu zero, epsilon zero, and I divide it by L, or I divide it by this, which is going to be mu naught over pi times the natural log of D minus A over A. And here, you can see the mu naughts cancel, and I have pi epsilon naught over the natural log of D minus A over A. And that is the capacitance per unit meter of a two-wire line. And it's a nifty way to do it, because I didn't have to calculate, but an inverse, right? Remember that. Mu epsilon equal LC for any TEM mode. That's transmission lines, parallel wires, things like that. Did anybody know this in here? It's covered in EMAG1, I think. You had me for EMAG1, right? Didn't I tell you about this? I remember that. These are professor's tricks. We do these all the time. Cuts down on our work. If we're making up a test, I know this. See, I've had the inductance. I'll ask capacitance. All right? Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah? How do you use right-hand rule knowing that it goes inward? This is the way the right-hand rule works with currents and the direction of the B field. First, you have to have a right hand. All right. Next, with your right hand, you put your thumb in the direction of the current. Then what you end up doing is act like you're opening a door. And in opening a door, your fingers point in the direction the current's gone. Like that. Like this. <laughs> Not like. <laughs> All right. Now, that's how you, that's, this would be the inductance and the capacitance for that. Uh, I'm going to do the induced EMF problem. I usually ask something about this. Not always, but. And I have not made out the final. <laughs> I'm glad it's Wednesday, in a sense. Now, you know that induced EMF, I, I guess I didn't give my little speech about nothing here, but of taking wire, walking around an apartment complex. No, I did that before, though. Uh, what? I did it in here? Oh, yeah, well, that's a, it's always one of the fun things to do that I'm sure the police will find a way to put you in a little jail for for some reason. Who knows what, but it just looks like detonator cord, you know? Got that much wire running around, looks like you're ready to blow something. Anyway, what I'm going to do for the EMF problem is start by saying, in general, when we talk about voltage EMF, that's an electromagnetic force created by a time-varying B field, it's equal to, in general, minus DDT of the integral of B dot DS over some surface. Now, this has to be a surface where a conductor really is around the edges of it. And so here's the typical kind of problem you get. If I say that this is my surface, this is wire, and this is my surface, so there's, some diff there's area A. Don't worry about the dimensions. It's in the plane of this actual board. And there's a B field. I'm going to have the B field coming out, not going in, like so. And it's uniform. And I can say that B in general, let's give this coordinate system. So let's say X is out of the board. That's Y and that's Z. So I'm going to have B as some B of T, and it's going to be coming out of the board in the AX direction. I'm trying to finish up here just to make sure you understand EMF. Now that B of T could be anything. It could be sine of 20T. It could be E to the minus 10T, right, E to the minus 10T, like that. It could be anything. So it's any function of time but it's in the AX direction. Now here, I need the differential surface right here. The differential surface of this would be equal to D, in this case, dy dz, 
Remember, you don't, it doesn't matter the coordinate system. It has to be the differential this way, differential this way, and it has to be perpendicular. So it would be, in this case, in the AX direction. You all follow me on this? Now, my voltage here is plus to minus. That's VEMF, and it's gotten by doing that. It's been a while since you did this. So that means my VEMF for that problem would be equal to minus DDT of the integral of B dot DS. Now, B, because it's a con it doesn't vary spatially, I can just take B of T and take it outside. And now when I take AX and dot it with this and integrate it, I really am just going to get the area of the loop. So it's really minus A times the derivative with respect to time of B of T would be equal to VEMF. Does everybody follow me on that? You notice that minus sign right there? Please listen to me. It means whatever that comes out to. That's the voltage measured positive here, negative here. Got me? Now, if it turns out it's positive, that is the voltage. If it turns out it's negative, reverse the signs, okay? Last thing I've got to say about this problem that sometimes gets people. If the voltage is like this, right? Let's assume this is the right polarity. Now, if I put a resistor on there, which way would current flow? This way, right? Because this is a source. Do you follow me? It's like a battery. Do you all follow me? It would flow from the positive terminal of the source to the negative terminal. Got me? If you wanted to replicate that by a fictitious source, what you could do is say, this wire exists in here. Forget about the induced EMF here. I'm going to say I'll put a fictitious source here that just has a value VEMF. And that would actually create that. Do you all follow me? Now, that's the way you can solve these problems if there's ever a load and you're not sure about things. Put a fictitious source that will cause current to flow in that direction. Here's why I'm saying it. Sometimes they may put one resistor there, one resistor there, one resistor there, and people get confused. But if you put a fictitious source that would drive current in a resistor attached there in the right direction, then it'll work. And that fictitious source just has the value of EMF. I know I'm over. Now, listen, if you have questions on Monday and Tuesday, I'm not sure of my schedule, but I should be in my office a fair amount. Do me a favor, though. Send me an email in the subject area, say 3320 office hours, something like that, so I can pull it out. I enjoyed this class.